Well, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, Mark's 14th chapter. And as we begin tonight, I want to start with the title. And the title is really important to understand because it gives us a grip on what we're going to be talking about throughout the course of this study. It's a tale of two lambs, and the subtitle is Transitioning from the Old Covenant to the New. Now, when I told this to my son earlier in the week, uh, thinking, you know, this is really really um, an important text, looking back to the Lamb of Passover and to the Lamb of God and the tale of two lambs, his answer was, is it T-A-L-E or T-A-I-L? It is not T-A-I-L. It is a tale, of the story of two lambs. Let me read that text for us. And it is, a, um, it is a deep and dense and rich section of Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed... His disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. And they were reclining at the table and eating. Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better, be good for that man if he had not been born While they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take this, take it, this is my body. And when they had taken the cup, he had taken the cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the kingdom, new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, Even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you that this very night, before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing also. This scene happens on the night before the crucifixion. We've made our way to Thursday night during Passover week. And what unfolds in the following verses are the most traumatic and significant events in the history of the world. As we've noted for many studies now, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's during the week-long Passover. He's found himself to the Temple Mount. He has defended. He has taught. He has been um, attacked and berated, and he has stood strong. And now he has infuriated the Jewish leadership. They have entered into a co-conspiracy with Judas to capture him and murder him. They were hoping that this could happen probably next week after the festival, as we learned last week. But it's going to happen exactly on God's timing and exactly as God's 
pawn, think about this, God's pawn, Judas, brings this to fruition. God is in absolute, complete control, even though Judas will be operating under the guise and power of Satan. Our text begins on Thursday afternoon with preparations for the Passover meal, and it climaxes with the meal itself. Now, a little background is going to help us here. It's going to give us some context as we navigate and understand this section of Mark. Think about this. The Passover meal was celebrated and begun for the very first time almost 1,500 years before this night. On that night, the Hebrews were delivered from slavery in Egypt after God commanded them to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost and on the lentil, the place above the door. Then, as we know, the angel of death passed over the Hebrews who had put this blood on their doors, not visiting the judgment that he visited as an angel of death on the Egyptians who did not have God's prescribed means of mercy around their door, the blood sacrifice. And as you know, especially if you've seen the Ten Commandments around Easter time, this was the last of the ten plagues that God enacted on Egypt. Exodus 11 verse 4 says this, Moses says, thus says the Lord, about midnight I'm going into, out into all of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before and such as shall never be again. God passed over, hence we get Passover, passed over the Hebrews who had followed his prescribed sacrifice to sacrifice this lamb, put the blood on the door, and he visited those in judgment who had not taken that provision. Each year since that very first Passover celebration, Jews gathered and continue to this day to thank God for his deliverance of the Hebrews from Egypt and slavery and bondage. Also, from the judgment of death. Remember, he saved them not only from getting out of Egypt, that was the Exodus, but he saved their firstborns from dying that night. It was a significant, listen, salvation event that became the paradigm for all other salvations throughout the rest of the Bible. Because of the lamb of Passover, because this lamb lost its life and bled for its owners, its blood could be applied by faith to those who followed the prescriptions. We've talked about this several times over the last few weeks. Let me read that section for you, remind you. In Exodus chapter 12, the first Passover prescriptions. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month, this is Exodus 12, 1, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year for you. In other words, the time of the Passover was pushing reset on the Jewish calendar. This was Nisan. This was the first month. This was their January. This was their beginning. Complete reset of the entire Jewish calendar based on this event. Speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, now do the math. Think about this. All right, kids, I want you to do math with me for a second. On the 10th, that's, the, that's uh, uh, Nisan 10, okay? On the 10th of the month, 10th day of the month, they are to take a lamb for themselves to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, he is to take his neighbor nearest to his house, and they are to take one lamb between them, according to what each man can eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from any of the sheep or the, from the goats. You may take it from the sheep or the goats, an unblemished male. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, Then the whole assembly of the congregation is to kill it. So, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
14, how many days is that, kids? Five days. They had this lamb in their house for five days. Why? Couldn't they have just taken the lamb and slaughtered it on the day of? Of course they could. But there was an intentionality behind God that this little precious lamb, and if you've ever been around a small goat or a small lamb and seen the innocence in those precious faces, they would basically develop a relationship with this animal almost like a pet. Then on the fifth day, they were to take it for food. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the doorpost and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh the same night, roasted with fire. They shall eat it with unleavened bread. Remember, we started to learn last week it was unleavened because there was no yeast in it because the idea was there's no time for the dough to rise. You're going to be leaving in a hurry, and they would be leaving tomorrow morning after this. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but rather roast it with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning. No leftovers. But whatever is left over in the morning, you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner. Listen to how much in a hurry they were. With your loins girded, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste, in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. Be ready to leave. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night. I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses. Where you live. And when I, this is God speaking, when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial for you and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance and it's celebrated even to this day in Jewish communities. Back to Thursday afternoon in Jerusalem. Jesus is likely traveling that afternoon on that Thursday from Bethany around the Mount of Olives up to toward Jerusalem. And he's setting up details for the Passover meal he will enjoy with them that night. But listen, this is no ordinary Passover. It is the last divinely ordained Passover in the history of Israel. It's about to be replaced by the Lord's table and by communion. Looking back at the Passover lamb, that was the lamb of sacrifice, it's going to be replaced by celebrating the lamb of God, the lamb on the cross. The Passover remembered how Israel was delivered from Egypt. And the new celebration, the Lord's Supper, will commemorate a far greater deliverance. The new Passover will remember the believer's deliverance, not from Egypt, not from a place, but from the power and the penalty of sin. Far greater. An eternal deliverance. So in these two observances of, of these Two deliverances from Egypt and from sin and bondage and death. At the same meal, Jesus and his men will celebrate the last Passover and the first communion within moments of each other. Jesus already knows, we learned last week, Judas is in cahoots with the high priest. He's already scheduled or told them he was going to schedule a time to turn Jesus over to them so that they could murder him. He has the full conspiracy enacted. But the Lord doesn't want his impending arrest to happen during this meal. 
Luke twenty two fifteen says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So a high degree of secrecy is going to be needed or the high priests are going to come in, crash the meal, and everybody's going to have the, the Lord's Supper interrupted and the last Passover interrupted. How are they going to keep this secret? Well, let's look at it first of all. Much is going to happen at this last meal. If you've ever been to a a, a Jewish Seder, usually around uh, Easter time, it's a a wonderful thing to to see. It's a meal that's usually abbreviated in our culture, but the meal could last anywhere from three to five hours during the Jewish celebration. A lot happened during this meal that night. In typical fashion, Mark abbreviates it, doesn't give us all the details that Mark and Luke, excuse me, that John and Luke give us, but we know it lasted long enough for the Lord to wash the disciples' feet, to have the full Passover meal, to confront Judas, to comfort his disciples, to institute the Lord's table, and to teach a large amount of final instructions, which include four chapters of John's gospel, John 13 through 16. We're going to move pretty quickly tonight. We're going to cover 20 verses, but there's a reason for that. It's necessary to see how the last Passover and the first communion are related. They are indeed the single meal divided into looking back and looking forward. In this passage, it's so tempting to look at the puzzle pieces. But I think if we look too deeply at the pieces, we could possibly lose the picture on the front of the puzzle box. So this is an enormous amount of text, and we are going to move quickly. We, there, there are so many places I know we're all going to want to stop and meander and spend more time at it, but we have to see it all together, and we'll be able to come back to some of these details, especially Judas, in just a few weeks. Notice also as we're going through this that there's a noteworthy pattern in the ceremonies. There's the last Passover followed by Judas's defection, the first communion followed by the disciples' denials or the prophecy of their denials. Much grace will follow in that second. Betrayal, memorial meal, prediction of denial, all related to celebrating sacrifice. So I think the best way to break this section down is to understand it from the perspective of the two lambs. So we'll think about it this way. Understanding the two lambs at the Last Supper. The two lambs are the Passover lamb and the Lamb of God. Understanding the two lambs at the Last Supper. The first is in verses 12 to 21, the Lamb of Passover. This is the culmination of the old covenant. Now, I'm going to say more when we get to our our second point about the the old and new covenant. It's basically the terms that God, when you see covenant, old covenant, new covenant, think covenant is like a contract. It's God's established terms of how he can be dealt with. It's how he can be approached. It's the conditions by which a man can have a relationship with God. That's the covenant. There's an old covenant established under the Mosaic law, and the new covenant that Jesus is going to establish beginning tonight. The Lamb of Passover, the culmination of the old covenant. Verse 12. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, he said to his disciples. Now this is on the first day when the lamb would be sacrificed. Remember, they're sacrificing them all day. For sometimes six or eight hours on Thursday, the lambs were sacrificed on the Temple Mount so the people could take the lambs to the respective places where they would then eat them that night. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, this is during the day, probably walking back from Bethany, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? Remember Luke 22 already said, Jesus says, I desire before I suffer to eat the Passover with you. And so they say, okay, where? When are we going to do this? What unfolds here, by the way, is really interesting. Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem back in chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, remember, sent two disciples ahead, remember? Remember? to secure the colt on which he would ride. 
And all the details when he got there were already established. Like that entrance, two disciples here are sent ahead for preparations for the Passover. Both of these errands included mysterious rendezvous with very specific details and conversations that were exactly predicted. I think both of these stories indicate the Lord's exacting knowledge. But let's also say it's quite possible that Jesus had prearranged this meeting with the slave and the owner of the house. There's nothing that would be uh, inappropriate about that. But there's a reason he would have done that. There's also no reason to assume that he couldn't have predicted all this and supernaturally, divinely brought it to pass. Every detail is known and embraced, though. Now, this is important. Jesus is being cryptic on purpose so that Judas does not know the place they're going to eat. Judas is going to be with him all day. He's not going to be one of the two that are sent ahead. Luke tells us that it was Peter and John who go ahead. Luke, uh, uh, Judas rather, is with Jesus that entire day up to the meal. He had no chance to get away to say, here's where the Lord is, come and arrest him. So verse 13 Jesus sends two of his disciples again. Luke tells us it was Peter and John. Instead of them, go into the city. That, would, that means they were outside of Jerusalem, probably on the road from Bethany. Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, so now we find out that this is a servant, perhaps a slave, carrying, getting water to go probably have it ready for this Passover meal that night. Follows him to the house. Now we meet the owner. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, which indicates that this owner knew who the teacher was. The teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? I don't have any trouble thinking that the Lord had prearranged this with this gentleman. He himself will show you a large upper room where they'll have the upper room discourse. Furnished and ready. Everything's ready, including, by the way, the pitcher of water, which this guy was bringing. Prepare for us there. Peter and John, go get the supper ready. Get the lamb, have it sacrificed, bring it to the uh, uh, house, get it roasted, get supper ready. So, verse 16, the disciples, Peter and John, went out, came to the city, And found it just as he had told them. And they, like dutiful disciples, got things ready. They prepared the Passover. This would have included going to the temple, having the lamb sacrificed, probably having it butchered on the side of the temple, and then taking it on probably the southwestern part is the most logical, most uh, uh, historic place that we think where the upper room was. And they began getting the room ready. Verse 17. When it was evening, he came with the twelve. Now you can be really confused about dating in the New Testament unless you understand the way Jews understood days. You and I have our calendar click over at midnight until... Midnight, right? That's how our our calendars go. The Jewish day began at sunset and went to tomorrow, how we would consider tomorrow's sunset. That's important. They eat the Passover. When evening came, they eat the Passover lamb on Passover, which was Thursday night. But that also means that the Passover was on Friday, which is when the lamb of God would be the ultimate Passover. You see that? Jesus will eat the Passover lamb on Thursday night and become the Passover lamb on Friday morning. Mark now fast forwards to the meal in verse 18. 
There's a lot that happens before verse 18. John tells us that there was an interaction with Peter, that the disciples uh, uh, had their feet washed by Jesus. There's a lot that happens. Mark just goes straight to the meal. As they were reclining at the table and eating. Okay, stop right there. Remember, we've talked about this before. This is an important scene to get in your mind. Ancient Jewish tables were shaped like a U. They had tables that were straight back and were connected by, by a front piece. That was so that the, 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 uh, usually the women and the slaves who would serve would come into the middle of the table and would serve everyone around the table. This table, though, is not like your and my table. It was about a foot high. And it was a foot high because they would have giant cushions all around these tables and they would recline, that's the word, lay with their elbow on one of the cushions and they would eat with one of their hands and recline with the other. Now, if you're... Uh, good with your imagination, you can see that if you're doing that, you are going to have your feet all around people's other, their bodies and their, their faces potential, which is why foot washing was so important, which Jesus actually did to them earlier. So you see this, can you see it in your mind? There's this huge ta- U-shaped table, Jesus probably sitting in the middle of the bottom of the U, that was the, the place of honor, and the disciples sitting all around the U. As they were reclining at the table and eating, in the middle of the supper, Jesus, Jesus drops a bomb. He said, can you imagine everyone's eating and talking? And he just looks around and he says, truly I say to you. Anytime he said, truly I say to you, you can be assured the disciples had their antennas fully extended. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. One who's eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him, one by one, surely not I. Are you talking about me, Jesus? James Edwards writes, there may have been only one traitor in the formal sense at this dinner, But by dawn, all the disciples will betray Jesus, if not from greed, verses 10 and 11, from weakness, verses 37 to 42, from fear, verses 50 to 52, from cowardice, verses 66 and following. Surely not I, he says, surely not I, how that protest echoes down through the centuries, end quote. And I think what he's saying is we all have this disposition. We wouldn't deny the Lord, but how many times have we been embarrassed to share the gospel? How many times have we shied away from standing up for righteousness? How many times have we, by our actions, by our deeds, by our silence, denied the Lord? Would you notice something with me? Amazingly, this indicates, when they're saying, is it me, is it me, that none of the disciples had any clue it was Judas. What an epic hypocrite Judas had been. He had fooled them to the very end. And I gotta tell you, that scares me to death as a pastor. This is the scene. Some people are so So self-deceived, they get all the way to the judgment. And Matthew 7 says they get to the judgment thinking they're okay, saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we, didn't we, didn't we? He says, depart from me, I never knew you. There's hypocrisy of treachery, which Judas had. There's hypocrisy of self-delusion, which Jesus addresses. I just find it shocking that they don't know, obviously, that it's Judas. Judas. It's going to get worse in a minute. Watch this. He said to them, verse 20, it's one of the 12 who dips with me in the bowl. What is that? This is significant. This indicates that in all likelihood, Judas was sitting right next to Jesus. How do we know that? Let's review the, the way Passover worked. They would use unleavened bread, which is, think of pita bread, just flat bread. And the flat bread would be served to them, and 
because of the ceremonial um, uh, regulations from the book of Exodus, and just because of delicious meal and taste. They obviously had the, the roasted lamb that, or goat that would come around. And then they had all of these small dishes that would have sauce or paste in them. Some were sweet with figs. Some were bitter with olive oil and bitter herbs. And they would take the bread, dip it in there, and eat it. Multiple bowls around. Usually one bowl between two or three people can you imagine if you were sitting across that you and you wanted some fig paste, getting up and going all the way around? It doesn't make sense. There were multiple bowls. So Jesus is making a specific attribution here. It's, it's, it's one who will dip his hand in the bowl. I'm dipping mine in with the paste. Listen to how John explains confusion at the table. We know that where Jesus was sitting was across the table from where Peter was sitting. We also know that on one side of Jesus, for sure, we know was John. How do we know that? Because where was John? He was laying on Jesus' chest. We know for a fact he was as close as you could have been. No one was between John and Jesus at this meal. But in all likelihood, Judas was on the other side. Simon Peter gestured to John. It's almost funny in the Greek. He hand signaled to John. So he's across the table and Peter's going, John, John. And said to him, tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. In other words, John, he's trying to speak where Jesus doesn't hear him. And he's saying, find out from Jesus who it is who's going to betray. He Leaning back on Jesus' bosom, that's John, said to Jesus, Lord, who is it? (laughs) Jesus then answered, that is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel in the paste, the, the bread, and give it to him. How specific is that? Right afterwards, after he says that, He dipped the bread, the morsel, into the paste and gave it to Judas. The son of Simon Iscariot. After the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, quietly, I'm sure, what you do, do quickly. Listen to what John says next. Now. No one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to Judas. For some were supposing, well, because Judas had the money box, Jesus was saying to him, buy some things that we have need for for the feast, or else that he should go be, be, uh, he's going to give something to the poor. After receiving the morsel, Judas went out immediately and it was night. I have to be honest with you, this stretches my imagination. When Jesus says, he obviously is sharing a bowl with Judas, the one that I dip the morsel in and give it to. He dips the morsel, he gives it to Judas. Judas then, he says, what you do, do quickly. Judas gets up and goes. I think they must must have been kind of off cue because he said, what you do, do quickly, which they thought was a task. And I think they were also pretty self-absorbed, thinking, am I the betrayer? Jesus was in absolute, complete knowledge and in control of the entire situation that was unfolding. He tells Judas to go betray him. Then Jesus says in Judas' hearing, it would have been better for him if he had never been born This tells you the wickedness in Judas' heart. Remember, John told us that Satan comes and infests him right after this. Jesus says to Judas, it says, it would have been better if the man betray me would never have existed. That did not deter Judas from getting up and going to do this deed. Again, I've told you, we're going to talk about Judas and his kiss in a couple weeks The amount of revelation that Judas had was exceeded by no one who ever lived. 
He watched Jesus heal. He heard Jesus teach. He saw Jesus raise the dead. He witnessed Jesus feed thousands with food that was literally created in his own hand. This was the last legitimate Passover to celebrate the deliverance from Egypt. The last legitimate Passover in Jewish history. And in verse 22, we transition from the last Passover, celebrating the Passover lamb, to the first communion, which celebrates the lamb of God. The lamb of Passover was the culmination, the finishing, the fulfillment of the old covenant. And now we come to the second lamb at the Last Supper, the Lamb of God. That's Jesus himself, the inauguration of the new covenant. Verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take it. This is my body. Now, we do this every other week, and it almost sounds natural and rote. But imagine hearing this for the first time. Take this bread, it is my body. Contra to what many Catholics teach, it was, he was not saying this dough, this baked bread, this pita has now transformed into flesh, human flesh. Now eat it. He took bread. And he said, this is my body, speaking as a symbol. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them regarding the drink, the cup, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Listen, friends, this is a monumental moment in biblical history. This is a monumental moment in the history of the world, of redemption. Jesus Christ of Nazareth actually changes the emphasis and meaning of the most important Jewish celebration, Passover, and he changes it into the Lord's Supper or communion. The shift is made from celebrating God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt to celebrating God's deliverance from sin and death and its bondage and penalty. The most important phrase here is when he says, this is my blood of the covenant. That's really, really important language. What's a covenant? As I said earlier, it's the terms that God enacts uh, on. This is the contract. This is the terms that I'm going to establish so that you can have a relationship with me, God says to his creatures. In the old covenant, it was you can have a relationship with me if you will follow my directions and annually in the Day of Atonement and in the Passover, slay a lamb that will provide atonement or covering for your sin. The problem with that, though, is you had to do it again next year and again next year and all the, the, the uh, sacrifices that came in between. That was the old covenant. It was incomplete, insufficient to last. They had to reduplicate it over and over and over. So God sets up a new stipulation, a new covenant, a new set of terms by which mankind can have a relationship with him. This is an echo, by the way, of the blood of the covenant and the old covenant. In Exodus 24, verse 3, down to verse 8, the covenant was sealed by the substitutionary sacrifice of an animal where Moses took the blood and splattered it all over the people. Likewise, this new covenant would also involve blood. But this blood would not be thrown on the people. Christ's blood would be applied to their spiritual ledgers for forgiveness of sin. Remember this too. The crucifixion was a grotesque action. But the victim on cross typically didn't bleed to death or bleed that much. 
Blood meant death, not just bleeding. If it was just blood, he could have, you know, cut his hand and bled on the altar, and that would have been it. Blood meant death. The reference here to many is also important. It's in it's an echo of Isaiah 53, 12 on salvation for many. And also, remember Mark 10, 45? We looked deeply at that. The Son of Man did not come to, serve, to be served, but to serve and to offer his life as a ransom for who? How many? Many. Jesus is directly linking his death to the idea of a substitutionary, vicarious sacrifice for sinners that was pictured in the Passover and now will be culminated and fulfilled and forever finalized on his own, in his own death on the cross. He says, this is the covenant made with my blood. It's the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Jeremiah said, remember, Jeremiah is looking forward to the ratifying of the new covenant. And he says in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not like the old covenant which I made with their fathers the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, specifically talking to the covenant made at the Passover. My covenant which they broke, by the way, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. That's why Hosea calls them harlots, the nation. But as this covenant, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, on their, in their heart. I will write it. I will be their God. They shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor saying, and each man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me. Individual relationships with God through Christ, from the least to the greatest. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Not just till next year, no more ever. Jeremiah predicted that. The writer to the Hebrews on the other side looks back at Jeremiah and says, in chapter 8, for that if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. In other words, the first covenant was insufficient. Because it had to be repeated. It was also insufficient because a lamb's blood, though it could temporarily cover, could never fully pay for and atone for human sin. That's why Hebrews 9 explains that. Then the writer quotes Jeremiah 31, and he finishes in chapter 8, verse 13, when he said, A new covenant... He has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Old covenant has been fulfilled. New covenant with Christ's blood fully established. Listen to how clear Paul was. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. Listen to this sentence. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Paul understood that the lamb of Passover was replaced because it was obsolete with the permanent lamb of God as the lamb as the Passover lamb. And if that's not clear enough, remember Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, when when Jesus was coming to be baptized and he sees Jesus walking down the road. He knew him very well. He grew up with him. It was his cousin. He knew him and he says to the crowd, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, Jesus chooses to create symbols, not the executed, the the, um, uh, butchered lamb, but actually bread and wine. The bread, he says, symbolized his body. His body. We often get tripped up on, well, is it body? Is it, is it physical? Is it transubstantiational? Is it consubstantial? No, the, put the accent on his. His body would be sacrificed. Not a lamb, not an animal. His body. This is my body, he said. And the cup symbolized his blood. 
He would be the sacrifice. His blood would be the final covenant-keeping, covenant-making term of our relationship with God. Verse 25. Truly I say to you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine. That's just wine. Until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the last celebration and supper I'm going to have with you until in the kingdom of God. Now there's a lot of questions. When does the kingdom of God start? Let me just tell you there's an already and not yet dimensionality of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God started when Jesus rose from the dead. He had several celebration meals with the disciples in the month that he was here before the ascension. But the realization, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God will not happen until he establishes a millennial kingdom, a physical kingdom, when all of those promises to Israel will be fulfilled. And we believe that to be a thousand year reign yet to be in the future. The point he's saying is not to make some big millennial argument here. You know what he's saying? I'm going to rise from the dead. I'm going to rise from the dead. I will not stay dead. You are going to see me crucified, but I won't stay in the grave. I will celebrate with you in the future alive. Clear promise of resurrection. Verse 26, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Remember, they have now dropped down into the Kidron Valley and are, have crossed over and about to go over to the, the Mount of Olives. There's a little grove of trees, a grove of olives called Gethsemane, where they will be heading next. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it was written. And now he says, You're about to enter into biblical prophecy these 11 men. Zechariah 13, 7 says, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. The prophecy that the suffering servant, the Savior, would be struck and all of his followers would scatter in the moment of distress was about to take place. Look at verse 28. But after I have been raised, look at, don't miss the, 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 the connection between 27, he's struck, he's killed, and verse 28, after I've been raised, I'll meet you up north, 100 miles north in Galilee. I think it's fair to say that none of these disciples, the 11 that are left after Judas departs, thought they would abandon Christ, but they all were about to in just a few hours. Their abandonment, however, was different than Judas. Judas turned against the Lord out of rejection and betrayal. These men had momentary weakness from which they repented. All of these men would die for the Lord. Listen, if you've ever had a momentary lapse and weakness in your faith, the problem is only if you stay there, not if you repent from there. Jesus had already told them three times, Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 34, that he would go to Jerusalem, be tortured, be killed, and rise from the dead. Verse 29. Now, verse 29 begins with a phrase that you could do a Bible study on and have, have a lot of interesting data. But Peter said, but Peter said, follow along in your New Testament as to what comes after that phrase. Peter said to Jesus, to him, even though all may fall away. Who are the all? The other 10 guys. He's obviously distancing himself from, the, from his brothers. Even though all may fall away. Jesus just said all would fall away. Yet I will not. Before he can finish even saying this, Jesus says to him, truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. 
Peter's undeterred. Here's our phrase again. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And now the chorus jumps in, the other ten guys. And they were all saying the same thing too. Do you see, do you feel the grace in this passage? Jesus knew very well that all of those men were about to run from him in just a couple hours. He also knew they would all be restored. He made a rendezvous point in Galilee for the following week. But there's something more. Jesus knew that Peter, headstrong, obstinate, proud Peter, would one day have a future ministry ahead even to the other men. Luke 22 gives us a little bit more color on this conversation. Luke 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, Jesus says, Behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I think that's interesting. Peter's confidence failed. His cowardice took over, but his faith did not fail. And then he says this, and you, when once you have turned again, will strengthen your brothers. This is just incredible. After telling him he's going to deny him three times, after telling him that he was going to run, after telling him he was going to be a sheep that was that will scatter as a shepherd is struck, he still looks at Peter and says, but still, even though you're going to say three times, this is just across the page. You don't even know me. Christ won't disown him and he will have a pastoral ministry as a leader to those brothers and to, any, to others as well. He will tell Peter three times at the end of John, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Judas failed and was condemned. Peter and the other men failed and found forgiveness. What was the difference? Their faith. Judas was a complete hypocrite. These men had weak faith, but they had faith nonetheless. Remember that at the first Lord's Supper, the participants were traitors, cowards, Now as then, the Lord's table is not for righteous men and women. It's for sinners in need of grace. It's not a table of merit and accomplishment. The best thing we bring to the Lord's table is a sense of our own unworthiness. And he meets us there and says, I was worthy for you. The best one thing we bring is a sense of our sinfulness. And he meets us there with his righteousness and forgiveness. The Passover of Israel did not involve God passing over people who were righteous. These were sinners who just applied the blood of the Lamb. In the same way, the Lord's Supper is not a celebration by those who are righteous, but sinners who have been forgiven by the blood of the Lamb of God in the new promise, the new terms, the new covenant of giving our faith to Christ.